Everybody, no more sleeping in bed. No more backward thinking, time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be. There is so much. Hello and welcome everyone to today's installment of our Leading with Justice speaker series. We're so happy to have you today. As we get started, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we love to hear what your favorite quote of the day is. If you want to tag that with the hashtag Leading with Justice or tag us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, we're all over the place. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, some quick housekeeping. We are recording the webinar. Uh, audience cameras and mics are not going to be on. We will have ASL interpreters today and closed captions. If you'd like to turn on the closed captions, you just press the uh, CC Live transcript button there. And we're going to be connecting in two ways with folks. In the chat, we'd love to hear your musings. You know, uh, go ahead and share with us if you have any technical questions or inspiration. Go ahead and put that in the chat. And then if you have questions about the talk, about the discussion directly for our presenters, please add those to the chat, or excuse me, to the Q&A section so that we can make sure and uh, ask our presenters. Uh, we want to do a quick land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we walk on was inhabited and protected by others before us. With honor and respect, we proceed with today's event. Uh, in the chat, if you could please share your name and what land you reside on. If you go to this link here, www.native-land.ca, you can see a map of all the different uh, territories and let us know what land you reside on. Uh, we, uh, I'll be putting this in the chat momentarily. And then uh, if you want to take it a step further, we also have uh, a link here for uh, making some donations and returning land to Indigenous people. Uh, and with that, I would like to welcome EDD Faculty Director, Dr. Vajra Watson. Greetings and peace, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really honored and excited for today's Lunch and Learn, and it really couldn't happen uh, without all of you. Before we begin, I just want to give thanks to our partners. The Leading with Justice series occurs because of support from the Sac State College of Education, SMUD, the Sacramento Kings, Fresno State's EDD program, and Sacramento Area You Speaks Says. So over the past year and a half, we've been facilitating generative conversations that push our thinking and our doing. What does it mean to lead with justice, to learn with justice, to love with justice? Last week, Daniel O'Connell and Scott Peters discussed their book, In the Struggle, Scholars and the Fight Against Industrial Agribusiness in California. During the discussion, Dan shared that, quote, land opens imaginaries of possibilities, unquote, and shared about community organizing throughout the Central Valley. 
their scholarship demonstrates that it's not just about fighting against environmental racism, but reclaiming sacred space of soil and sovereignty. We witness important intersections to the work of Dan, Scott, and the mighty, mighty Lee Patel, because land is the central organizing feature in settler colonialism. Lee Patel's newest book, No Study Without Struggle, Confronting Settler Colonialism in Higher Education, pushes our analysis to include the very institutions that educated us, the places where so many of us now work. She writes on page 31, I'm just saying, uh, <clears throat> in order for higher education to be more inclusive, it would actually need to reckon with its history, its origins, and the ongoing nature of colonization and transform its way of being. She inspires us to make and take on new meaning when it comes to learning. She explains the struggles to learn by marginalized students is itself a form of love, not romantic love, but the love of learning and its inextricable relationship with life itself. When I read Lee Patel's work, I feel like my mind is taking a deep breath and able to expand. It is revelation and remembering. Her work often takes me to a particular place, a place where I first met Queen Medina Jackson. Medina's here with us today too. So Medina and I attended Berkeley High School together and had teachers that poured into us in the Black Studies Department. We come from a legacy of learning that is liberatory and we honor this lineage. Shout out to Mr. Hadari Davis, Mama Naomi Washington, Mr. Navies, Mr. Kwame, Mr. Hood, Ms. LaShawn Rute, Mr. McKnight, to name just a few of our teachers. And both of us are still striving to continue this tradition. Today, Medina Jackson is the Director of Engagement for the University of Pittsburgh's PRIDE program. PRIDE stands for Positive Racial Identity Development and Early Education, which focuses on helping young Black children understand race and embrace their heritage through several community-based projects. Medina, artistically known as I, Medina, is also a mother, spoken word artist, writer, and creative space maker. She is involved in multiple projects and initiatives intersecting Black liberation, the arts, racial oppression, and healing. She's originally from South Berkeley, California, came to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2001, obtained her MSW from the University of Pittsburgh with a focus on community organization and social administration, and she's committed, been committed to the city ever since. Please welcome her into the space for this poetic groundation. She will be followed by Professor Shiva Sabati, who will further frame our talk and introduce Queen Lee Patel. Let's go, people. Let's do this. Peace, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm going to jump right in. It's an honor to be here in this space with all of you. And I'm going to share a poem that I wrote called Sight Black Women. And Sight Black Women is an entire movement, so I did not originate that phrase, but this is my poem of the same name. And if you don't identify as a Black woman or femme, but feel like there are things in this piece that relate to you, then this is for you as well. Sight Black Women. The sisters who walk the halls of academia with research publications and the women with whom you've profited from their passionate orations and reserved iterations cite Black women. The women you sat down with and informally picked their brains, the women whose names no longer remain on that great idea you framed cite Black women who are part of your lineage of greatness, whose names you shall not recall, who are on your advisory boards and focus groups and group projects and ad hoc blue ribbon committees, the women without a PhD or any type of degree, the women who sleep sweet floors and flip burgers and change diapers with wisdom beaming through clenched teeth, the healers who the researchers seek, the women who share the divinity with you at the water cooler and fireside chats and work retreats, 
incite Black women. The women who are seen as bitter cogs in the machine, whose offerings are beyond what you can imagine, whose offerings you need to catch up to, whose offerings are swarming in the bitches brew you thought you knew, cite Black women. The women who won't get funded for that grant because their writing doesn't come for the academy or may be completely unaware of those opportunities because they've been too busy turning water into wine for centuries. The women who can show you better than they can tell you, who may do their work better than they can articulate it. And why do we have to be so many things anyway? Cite the women whose sheer existence elevates your life force and expands your consciousness. And yes, we birth you anyway. Cite the black women who didn't have it for herself but handed it over to you many days. The women who know what needs to be done because what has been done lives in our bones and hair follicles and raised eyebrows and heightened breath. Cite black women for the hate you gave and the grace we gave, not because we wanted to, but we were trying to save ourselves from early graves. Cite the women that you tried on and discarded. Cite the brave and lonely hearted. Cite the sister mama home girl whose shine has been co-opted and appropriated into something unrecognizable to naked eyes that ain't willing to see. That lit chick, that sister and femme that you got your yes, hunty from taking notes while they're just popping their gum, taken, repackaged and duplicated into something sterile like the white walls of a sanitarium. Cite Megan Thee Stallion for hot girl summer and hot nerd fall. Cite the black women whose voices won't be heard at all, who will not get the opportunity to be in those rooms and on those stages because these systems were not built for them to thrive. Cite the black women who are still trying to change it from the inside, cite black women whose pain and trauma have been transmuted into content for your consumption, insatiable eyes that are never satisfied, cite Black women, who question their belonging in this country, whose engine has run on the backs of our labor, reproduction, and experimentation without permission. Say her name, Henrietta Lacks. Say her name, Katherine Johnson, whose excellence extended us into the cosmos. Cite our love, loss, and loins. Cite our orgasms and screams of ecstasy, whose seat at the table has already been bought and paid for many times over. Cite Black women who are the table's legs holding it up. Cite Black women who may not have the words to say it to you now. Cite Black women who can take your language and smack it up, flip it, and rub it down. Cite the sisters who have cold switched themselves into an oblivion of unmet longing and desire. Cite Black women whose Facebook posts and Instagram videos inspire dissertations and programmatic manifestations and evaluations. The fuck you, pay me, radical self-love declarations. Cite Black women, those introvert and socially anxious Black women who serve up their depth and song and prose without wanting to give you hugs because you are not owed any more than what they have already given. Say her name, Summer Walker. Cite Black women whose brilliance wasn't recognized until they turned to dust and became part of the ethers. Cite the yay yays, umis, grand rays, gmas, mamas, grannies, nanas, aunties and them who bounced you on their laps, patted your back and oiled your scalp, who taught you how to feel, who taught you how to smell the rain coming, whose whispers became gospel that put you up on game. Electric healing balm, I can hear your names traveling through my DNA, who are tired of trying to be free while fighting for the right to be free, who just want to be instead of fighting to be seen, who unleash their fury to educate you on her human humanity and the sisters who don't feel like doing that shit today and walk away. Cite Black women for dragging your ass to freedom when you were scared of the unknown. Cite the Black women whose love and dedication helped you level up and increase your trajectory. Those women you tossed aside after you grew, after you used her up as your lesson relationship and left her with your scent and shell that she will have to clean up for her growth. Cite Black women who want to collapse into a womb of rest and joy, but we got bills to pay, who simply want to say yes to our fullness and live there, who just want to feel, deal, and heal our goddamn selves without it always having to, to be in service of someone else. Cite direct service workers and frontline warriors in the streets who deserve to put their swords back in their sheets and sit on a beach for just one damn minute without movements and programs falling apart without us. Cite Black women for being humanity's first home, for the very breath traveling in and out of porous lungs, up and down your trachea. Deep breath in, deep breath out. 
cite her, thank her, pay her. I'm gonna say that again. Cite her, pay her, thank her for the gift of life she has given us all. Cite the black woman, Kristen A. Smith, PhD, who founded this call. Cite black women. Thank you. Thank you, Medina. I think um, if we were in space together physically, we would be hearing lots of um, snaps and uh, yeah, just resonance with your words. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Cite her, pay her, thank her. Um, cite black women. Citation is a political practice, right? You're reminding us of the very extracted, extractive nature of colonial knowledges of these institutions, of the theorizing and um, political work that Black women do every day. Thank you so much for grounding this space. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shiva Sabadi, and I'm really honored to be one of the new assistant professors in the EDD program here at Sac State. I am joining today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupe tribe, which today is stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band. I want to echo and encourage that we not only acknowledge the indigenous lands that we are on, but that we also show up through our actions by supporting the work of indigenous nations. And this includes giving your time, your money, or other resources to grow Indigenous-led efforts in your local community. It is sincerely an honor to be invited to join this webinar today to introduce and share space with a thinker, organizer, and educator who has moved and continues to move me so deeply through her work and through how she shows up in space, Dr. Lee Patel. Lee Patel's work is based in the fact that as long as oppression has existed, so have freedom struggles. She is a transdisciplinary community-based researcher, as well as an elder care provider, educator, writer, and cultural worker. She is a professor of education foundations, organizations, and policy in the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as affiliate faculty in Africana Studies and a faculty fellow with the Center for Urban Studies. Prior to being employed as a professor, she was a middle school language arts teacher, a journalist, and a state level policymaker. Professor Patel is also a proud national board member of the Education for Liberation Network, a nonprofit that focuses on supporting low income people particularly youth of color, to understand and to challenge the injustices their communities face. Dr. Patel is truly a public scholar, both in the content and the reach of her work. She has been interviewed by and has written for public outlets, such as The Atlantic, Beacon Broadside, NPR, The Conversation, and The Feminist Wire. She has published dozens of academic research articles and is the award-winning author of five books, including her 2013 book, Youth Held at the Border, Immigration, Education, and the Politics of Inclusion, as well as the 2015 book, Decolonizing Educational Research from Ownership to Answerability. Personally, Dr. Patel's writing is the kind that I delight in. It is beautiful, it is incisive in ways that move me and my thinking. Her latest book that we're here to think with and um, celebrate, No Study Without Struggle, Confronting Settler Colonialism in Higher Education, surfaces the distinct yet deeply connected and intertwined forms of oppression experienced by BIPOC, queer, undocumented, working poor, and students from other marginalized communities, while also shedding light on the constant presence of political education for social transformation 
in the spaces where many of us teach and work. So um, in the words of Leif Patel, to name settler colonialism as an organizing feature of institutions of higher education, as well as its intersections with anti-Blackness, heteropatriarchy, means nothing short of the following. So bear with me, I'll read a few of Dr. Patel's words. And if you have the book with you, I'm on page 155 under the subheading Confronting Settler Lives. When we say their names, when we articulate the histories and contemporary moves of colonization that have been the backbone of this settler nation, we may ruffle feathers. If that outcome is a primary concern, then we're already adrift in any project of transformation. The core purpose of naming the root of violence is to abolish it so that a better society may grow. When we say their names and work together to think about the complex relationship with land that settler colonialism has created for many populations, we position those very populations and their relation to each other and the land as central to the act of agitation. We acknowledge the ways we are indebted to each other, not in terms of money, but in terms of interconnectedness. We act with the maturity it takes to understand the importance of telling the truth of those whose lives and histories have been squandered. We pick up the mantle for the struggle to study that has existed since oppression first created its metrics to deny access to learning to millions as a way to deny their humanity. So this is just some of the deep wisdom that comes forward in this really important and timely book. I'm so excited for today's conversation. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Lee Patel. Can I kick it? Can I kick it? Yes, you can. 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 Can I kick it? Thank you so much. Um, my eyes already have had tears in them from the wonderful wisdom of Queen Vajra, who to know Vajra knows that she is always organizing, always bringing people together, always thoughtful of where people are coming from and thoughtful about how to take care of them. Not all by herself, she gathers people with her. I have a tear in my eye to see my neighbor, Medina Jackson, I Medina, Queen Medina and her wisdom that flows and ignited so much inside of us. I have a tear of recognition and longing and missing my dear sister, Shiva. I'm so grateful to be introduced with such grace, with such beauty by somebody who I hold in deep regard um, and who has been a teacher of mine. Uh, Shiva referred to herself as a new assistant professor, but I can assure you that she is a long time educator, teacher, and learner, which makes her a very good educator. It's my honor to be an uninvited guest um, where so many of you are in the lands of the Lenape peoples and other peoples. I'm coming to you from the unceded territories of the Omaha peoples. Uh, more specifically, my mother's basement, because I am that 51 year old who lives in her mother's basement and will cling to every minute of every day that I am able to share space with her, because it is truly um, probably will be the most special time in my life. So I'm honored to be with you here today, and I thought that I'm already graced by um, portions um, of the book that Vajra and Shiva were so gracious in sharing. So what I thought I might do for a little while, maybe about 10 minutes, um, with keeping my eye on Jasmine, thank you for your work, 
thank all of our ASL translators. I'd like to read you a letter of love and a letter of gratitude that I think is a good introduction to this book um, and why I wrote it. So how can a love and gratitude letter include the words confront, study, and struggle? Because it is a love for learning, a love so big that I have to talk about settler colonialism and its violences to tell you how much bigger learning is. It is a love letter for every Native person who is asked after they have already invited uninvited guests and then are asked as Eve Tuck has written for honey-do lists about what white and arrivant settlers can do to not feel so badly about settling on native lands. My love and gratitude letter says to you and says to me, feel badly about it, dear one, but don't build a house and live in that guilt. Learn more, read more with others and act from knowledge and humility and answerability. What, what does my love of learning have to say about settler colonialism? As it's already been described so wonderfully from the excerpt that Bajra read um, and also Shiva, it's a structure. It is not an event. It is a structure that is alive and unfortunately well in our society. It's an ongoing set of relations set into motion when people came into other people's homelands and disrupted, destructed the relationship that peoples had with those lands. So settler colonialism, it desires wealth and property. Again, as Eve Tuck says, it's about the land, it's about the land, it's about the land. Desires wealth and property, but just for a few. And that cannot happen without the, the displacement and debt of millions. Debt is intimately tied to wealth. In fact, in this capitalist society, the very structure of economic stratification dictates that many must constitute an underclass, meaning that they are housing and food and safety insecure so that a few may profit greatly. This is the foundation of capitalism, more specifically racial capitalism in which racism and class stratification intersect to reproduce race and class stratifications across generations. Even Marxist critiques of capitalism have been susceptible to the clutches of Eurocentric thought. As the late Black Studies scholar Cedric Robinson, Cedric with the C, wrote, Marxism is a Western construction, a conceptualization of human affairs and historical development that is emergent from the historical experiences of the European peoples mediated in turn through their civilization, their social orders, and their cultures. So this is why we need different theories, because they take us to different sources of knowledge and different knowledge systems. In Pittsburgh, with my neighbor, I Medina, once a steel city and now a city fueled by the industries of higher education and healthcare, their rates of infection and death rose, but disproportionately with the global pandemic. The University of Pittsburgh, a predominantly white school, reported at the most only six dozen active cases of the virus in one week on campus during the fall 2020 semester. But the black population in Pittsburgh were 3.3 times as likely to die from the virus than young white undergraduates. This is the racial trade off that happens again and again in settler colonialism. It happens in this Eds and Meds city. Let's welcome Jen. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jasmine. And over to Jen. Thank you, Jen. This racial trade-off that happens in Eds and Meds cities 
maintains one group's safety at the literal expense of another. A city in which Black people die at higher rates because of environmental racism, working conditions, lack of access to health care, in a city whose tallest building once read U.S. Steel and now reads the letters of a medical corporation. I'd like to express my love and gratitude for every person and collective fighting and documenting in detailed fashion how the insurance industry waits for people to die rather than pay for them to live or not even charge them at all to live. This too is settler colonialism in our lives. I want to thank every collective fighting the active destruction of voter rights laws. I want to thank them for knowing that the repeal of those laws and using the laws to tell women again that their bodies are not theirs. I want to thank them for knowing that the laws banning kindergartners from reading critical race theory are all connected. Thank you for not falling for the hustle of arguing endlessly on CNN or MSNBC about what CRT is. Amber Ruffin did that for all of us. My love letter extends to every Black, Native, Asian, Latinx, and mixed race person who is grappling right now with the fact that race is a social construct created to deliver racism. And people have made homes within these categories through kinship, through found and created family, through ceremony that has transcended coloniality's desperate need for categories and ranking, and love, enough love to continue unlearning in order to learn. I want to share with you, this is, um, this is in the book, I should also share what page when I'm reading things from the book, um, as my wonderful queens have taught me to do. I'm reading from page 116. Uh, this person at the time was in her first year of doctoral studies and experienced wonderful black woman teacher in Boston. And she had gotten into the habit of coming to find me in my office after some of her classes that had pushed at what she knew to be true. She would come into my office and sit down in a chair and she would say, Patel, and I knew that I, would, I was going to hear about the things that she had to endure in a doctoral class. And this day, she started off in that chair. Patel, there is one week. One week when we are supposed to read a few articles recently written by Black scholars. This course, this course about the history of education starts with John Dewey. That tells me that this course doesn't know who I am, does not want to know, and is satisfied with starting educational research with one white man and inserting its one week of diversity. That is how settler colonialism sounds in the here and the now. And what is education in relation then to settler colonialism? I think we can best understand this through property and profit. We have to remember that the DNA of settler colonialism is about property and profit for a few. And remembering the lies that we've been told about education. This nation continually lies to us and tells us that education either is or can be the great equalizer. We are also told that we are a melting pot a nation built by immigrants. The nation tells these lies while deporting Haitian peoples to a nation that the US has literally raped, changing its topography so that these increasingly large hurricanes punish those lands that used to have varying topographies and now have been cleared because of US policies. The hurricanes do more damage now. 
These lies, a nation built by immigrants while deporting immigrants and blaming them for being climate refugees. These lies gloss over the fact that this nation built its wealth and its status as a violent empire through stolen labor on stolen land. And I have to write this letter of love and gratitude with these hard truths. So if you didn't learn that from school, school has been lying to you. I want to thank every K-12 teacher who has punctured these lies, trusted their students. Yes, even kindergartners are able to know that theft of any kind is wrong. And then what is higher education to a, to a nation whose DNA is settler colonialism? As the quote as I was reading before from my student, she explained, this doesn't have anything to tell me about myself. I already know I'm not in this picture. Knowledge is behind paywalls in higher education. And even more offensively to me as an educator, it is listed in what order it should be read by a largely white and male professoriate group of professors before they ever meet their students. That is property, that is domain, that is knowledge for the purpose of having a higher status. How could it be otherwise? Higher education first came into existence in this land for wealthy land-owning men. That wealth and those elite institutions all built through stolen labor on stolen land. Higher education has participated in this project, seeded like planting seeds through the United States formation. The Declaration of Independence was written by slave owners. The contradictions are sown into the formation of the nation and formal education. I want to thank and express love to every person who has raised a complaint. And as Sarah Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D, teaches us so well, that person, when they complain, they are then yoked into becoming a diversity worker so that the institution can say, see, look, we are paying attention to that complaint. Please email DEI voluntold at university.com. The last part of my love and gratitude letter is to learning itself. Lucille Clifton asks us, won't you come celebrate with me? And her prophetic poem that every day something has tried to kill her and has failed. For centuries, settler colonialism has been trying to kill Native peoples and their relations, and it has failed. For centuries, anti-Black racism has been trying to create structures to collapse Blackness into fungible chattel, and it has failed. For centuries, heteropatri heteropatriarchy, excuse me, has been trying to tell us that there are but two genders and two sexualities determined by biology, and it has failed. For centuries, this crazy bell curve has been trying to tell us that there is such a thing as normal and that people who are not normal are people with disabilities and it has failed. Has it taken lives? Yes. Has it harmed people and life? Yes. Have some people fallen for these hustles? Yes. But the project itself has failed. 
And we know this because of one major entity, study groups and learning. The very fact that we are gathered here today to talk truth about these institutions that, many, that pay many of us and charge many of us. I'm speaking directly if there are graduate students in the mix, you are being charged and you are getting underpaid at the same time. And we are here today to talk truth back to that and know that learning is bigger. Study groups come together, not because they get to wave a credential or a diploma around afterwards. They come together because they know that to act without having practiced the way that Mao Zedong writes about it is to act irresponsibly with what their ancestors did for them and what they must do for the generations to come. And I'd like to close with, um, with the last paragraph in my book, which has no spoilers. You already get what I'm talking about. I am often saying to the people I work with, be they students, be they colleagues, I say this, Institutions don't define us, our relationships do. In light of my critiques of formal education institutions, including higher education, I am sometimes asked why I work within them. The answer for me is a simple one. I love learning. I love that it is hard. I love that it is destabling, destabilizing. And in its most transformative ways, it demands us to literally be different, less individualistic, less competitive, and less punitive with ourselves and each other. But most fundamentally, I refuse to concede the catalytic power of study and learning together to settler colonialism. It does not get to own learning. Thank you. Colonialism does not get to own learning. So I want to welcome uh, into the space uh, Shiva and Queen Medina so we can talk um, and dive deep and continue to explore. One of uh, the doctoral students who just started, uh, Jimena, said in our first class, she's part of cohort 15, that they renamed themselves the disruptors. And um, she said, you know, I'm realizing that learning is my love language. And when I think about Lee's work and Shiva's work and Medina's work, um, <clears throat> and not even just our work, but this, this kind of way of being in the world and that learning is truly a love language and what it means to fall in love with learning, to be thirsty for knowledge, and that it takes so much of the ownership and accolades away. Um, so with that, I, I'm gonna open up with some questions, um, but is anything on your mind and heart uh, to anyone that they wanna say in this moment before we begin? Just all hail <laughs> that wonderful um, love letter that you shared with us. Um, and it really just made me think about how you can be so used to being inside of a thing that you may not question the nature of that thing. And so your love letter and all that you said invites us to question the nature of that thing. So I, I really appreciate all that you said and all that you shared. So I always have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so we learned so much in your book and I encourage everyone to, to read it and to really read, read everything you've ever, ever written. Um, but with this book in particular, um, what did you learn in terms of 
how to keep these systems from grinding the soul out of us. And maybe I'll turn to Lee, but if Medina and Shiva also want to add into that, what are those protective factors and how do we um, continue to build on them uh, to support one another uh, and these larger legacies? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to get us started but, and really interested in uh, Vajra, you as well, what you have to say about that question. Don't just don't think that I'm going to let you post questions and not opine and speak truth as you do. How do we not let our souls be grinded out in these systems? Well, the person who I quoted in the book is in the space today. So part of how we do that is we don't, I know this person not as a student. I know this person as an accomplished, beautiful teacher, self-determined. We don't see each other through institutional roles. That's a very important part. We refuse the hierarchy. Part of how we, part of how I have been helped to not let my soul be grinded out of it is to the reminder that that this is centuries long work that we are doing. We did not get here in a day. We are not gonna fix it in a day. Even though it may have felt that way when I, Medina, was spitting her poem, may have felt like that, that's stoking our fire. So we remember this is centuries long work and that makes what we do today no less urgent. It just means it's not all going to happen today. The last or the third thing that comes to my mind is company and collective. How we don't get our souls squeezed out of us is we become parts of collective and we form collective. We're parts of study groups. Harney and Moten remind us that study is happening when we're talking, when we're walking, when we're eating, when we're dancing, when we're bopping our heads to our walk-on songs. That is study. We study all the time. So part of being a collective means looking out for each other. And in the United States of America, refusing individualism by looking out for oneself and each other Take care of yourself and each other is a huge disruption in individualism. Collectivity is part of how we don't let our souls be grinded out of ourselves. Because without company, that is exactly what happens. I just want to say really quick, building on what you just said, I think that there is a trick that institutions often make that they will outlive us. And there's this, this, I think, dangerous narrative of how old the institutions are. But even if you think about white supremacy, which seems, you know, implosive and evasive, white supremacy is a relatively young concept in human history. And so then when you say what predates borders, all of a sudden, the universe becomes a wider and broader and deeper conceptualization. And then even white people ourselves look like about three years old. And whiteness looks about so infantile and bratty. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this institution is so young and fragile. Settler colonialism is so weak. Oppression has been playing the same chess game for just a hundred some odd years when we're talking about the scope of the earth, the scope of existence, the scope of humanity. So I love the way you continue to go deeper in the roots to what predates those borders so that we can like hold on to like each other and ourselves and not see these institutions as status quo, but really like mirages of power because the people are the power. So I just, uh, that made me think of that. What y'all got, Medina, Shiva, where are you at? Where are you at? <laughs> or Lee, come with that hand. Yes. And thank you, Jasmine. 
Chief, I saw you un unmute yourself, so I'll let you go first. As one of my good friends say, what you're seeing here is we, it's like we can't walk through a door together because there's so much love. We want to uplift each other up. <laughs> you go first, you go first. Um, uh, well, what I was going to say, but please come back in because, um, but in terms of like thinking about not having our souls grinded out, when I was teaching the past few years, I was working primarily with undergraduates and the pandemic hit and you know, I just think that it was such a, um, like, I, I always knew this, but like in really important ways recentered for me, like, why am I even here? Like, I'm not here to surveil my students. I'm not here to punish them and, you know, like, um, create these learning environments that are pretending like nothing is going on. And I think that that was a really important moment to re recenter, right? Reattune to my own intention to why, why I do this work, right? As Lee said, it's not about the institution, it's about the relationships and it's about the, you know, the critical work that has happened that have allowed us, you know, as scholar activists, right, to do the sort of work that we do in these spaces. So I think that piece that you highlighted, Lee, um, of centering the relationship is so important, right? Because it reminds me, like, why, why am I in this work? And from that space of intention, you know, it, it allows the rest of it to become the noise, right? And to, to fall away a little bit more. Um, and I also, I just wanna enter into the space, like we all have different forms of work to do based on how we're positioned, right? And so I think, um, think about like the work that there is to do to, to let folks who need to like uh, rest in the, in the work of the NAP ministry, right? Thinking about, um, uh, Tricia uh, Hersey, who founded that, right? Like, who are the folks that we need to let rest, right? Who have been propped up and centered as like doing diversity, equity, inclusion work and holding that for everyone and who needs to step in and um, take responsibility and accountability in different ways. So I'll add on, um, thank y'all for sharing um, your thoughts about this. So in terms of this question, what came to mind first was um, a quote by Grace Lee Boggs where she basically says these systems of oppression live inside of us. And so for me, a lot of my self-work is recognizing the nature of the systems that ha I have participated in and been impacted by and really understanding uh, what has happened to me what is going on inside of me, you know, from childhood up until this point, right? You know, Dr. Beverly Tatum, she talks about um, racism and messaging around racism being this smog that we all breathe in. So we're all socialized to inhabit and project oppressive thinking, oppressive messaging. We're socialized to do that from a very young age. So a big part of my work is understanding all of those dynamics outside of myself and inside of myself. And then um, I love what um, Lee shared about uh, self and collective care. I'm really, I'm a really big advocate of that. Um, and I love, love, love uh, Adrian Marie Brown's book, Pleasure Activism. That book saved me. <laughs> <laughs> that book saved me because it really, um, in a multiplicity of ways, it talked about, and she references Audre Lorde a lot, she references and cites many, many, many Black women, many Black queer women, um, and she talks about allowing your pleasure to be your guide um, in terms of what it is that you feel that you're supposed to be doing. Um, so whatever you feel that your work is, right, because the work can feel very big at times, and you can sometimes feel like you're pissing in the ocean, even if you're doing a lot of great work, it can be very overwhelming. So for me, I said, okay, I got a limited time on this earth. I don't know when I'm rolling out of here. So what is it that I want my work to be? And what, how can I continue to humanize myself in a way and allow that space for myself and to be in community with others but we can do our work together in a way that feels meaningful and that feels impactful and that that feels progressive so whenever i get overwhelmed i just kind of tap back into and tune back into that 
um, and my pleasure as a guide. May I may I add something here, Vash? I know Vash says I know you have a, another boom question waiting for us. Um, just boom power. So if you, I I get to know a bit more of of Queen Medina's work because of our proximity through the University of Pittsburgh, and Queen Medina has infused care into her work. Um, so there's not that compartmentalization. There is also retreat that is necessary. So as much as practice is necessary, we, every time we're not practicing, we're not practicing, but we also need retreat time. I wanted to acknowledge Jose Cintron had put a statement in the chat and I want to acknowledge this because Jose, what you're bringing up is that there is an incommensurability to having a big love of learning and working with or for or being underneath the shadow of the ivory tower, there is an incommensurability. So I think there are ways that all of us who are in some kind of relation with higher education do something with that incommensurability. Because I don't care what endowed chair position Harvard Graduate School of Education puts out there, that place is not going to turn into a freedom school. It is a bank. It is going to continue to be a bank. And there's many others. I'm just picking on Harvard. Yale is a bank. Princeton is a bank. Northwestern is a bank. Other institutions are corporations. They'd like to be banks, but they're corporations. So there is that incommensurability, and it's important to name what we do with that, how we are with that is an important question in terms of what we can do. For myself, I, part of the reason why I uh, went up for full professor is so that I could be in the room when people spewed nonsense about, well, they should have published these many, they come in with their abacus and their slide ruler, measuring everything, but all based on what Sis Vajra reminded us our very baby metrics. So I'd be in that room to say, you don't know actually how long it takes to collaborate and you're trying to make a pie graph out of it. Collaboration cannot be cut up into pieces. So that's an example of what I try to do with that incommensurability. Then I leave those spaces and I go complain. I write, I talk to my sisters. I heal in some kind of way. But yes, Jose, you bring up an excellent point. Thank you for that. Man, I'm, we're already starting to wind down. And, um, you know, what a what a detriment, the, the Western clock. Um, in in one of your previous books, I always think about this moment where you, you know, you had the deadline to write the book. And you ended up like going and like, I don't know if you were like in a, some type of boat or like you were rowing or, you know, it's some little, I can't remember exactly, I, you know, but I, I always have this moment in my head because I think, gosh, the, being trapped by the task list and also just like how much work and kind of building on what Medina just said. And one of the things that you wrote about that, that, you know, hit me so like, is the patience, the pause, and the relax. And I know that we also just talked about the NAP ministry. So maybe kind of as we close this part of the conversation, kind of what brings you joy? What brings you pause? Um, what fills you kind of back up? And, um, you know, and what does the land teach you? So, some, you know, however anyone wants to kind of take that. Um, but I so appreciate the ways that you connect um, pause and health and care. And I actually think that Medina and Shiva also do that so beautifully as well. So maybe if we can close on, on those pieces of wisdom. I'll go fast and first. Don't go fast. We going slow, girl. We on turtle time. All right, right, right. I mean, I'll be here for the after party. I know other people got things to do. Um, <laughs> this book was late too. It was a year late because life was happening. The pow the pause is so powerful, and 
and let's be honest so often time so often when people have not either intervened so that they are allowed themselves a pause they haven't forced a pause because they are afraid of what might happen when they sit down and it's just them people are afraid to pause that's the way I believe part of what I, Medina, was telling us that these oppressions live within us. So capitalism isn't roaming around somewhere out there on the street. That capitalism is like, I have to stay doing, I have to stay doing. I have to just stay doing so much that I'm afraid what will come up if I pause. So I am pausing these days. Um, gonna shout out another book by Adrian Marie Brown. I'm reading Grievers because I have had it with a society that will not say how much grief is in our bodies and in the air. I am done not acknowledging that people are hurting, that they are tired, that they are grieving, and that there are also tears that become oceans from their grief, oceans of possibility. So that is where I am at right now in my pause is really respecting grief. I'll share and say that for me, oh, wow. Um, so my, my practice of care is alive. It's evolving, right? And I'm allowing it to evolve. So one piece of that is saying no, <laughs> which allows more space for my yeses to be bigger and more fulfilling, right? So that's one piece. Instead of feeling like I have to do everything, you know, that's one thing that the pandemic taught me and how, you know, we all had to slow down. And I'm trying to carry some of the blessings from the pandemic. I know it was, it was a rough time. There were some personal blessings for me that emerged out of that. I'm trying to hang on to that. Um, also, I love just the doing versus the being. So I'm focusing a lot more on my being right now and really tapping into my wholeness. And instead of looking at myself as not being whole, my wholeness is already there. I'm just still learning about all the pieces that it embodies and encompasses. And what brings me joy this, these days um, and how I'm pausing is I do take naps. <laughs> I allow myself to rest without guilt, used to feel guilty. Now I do not feel guilty and it's fine, right? Um, I enjoy time with my son. He's a super skateboarder. I'm gonna get on that skateboard and we gonna skateboard together. Skater mom over here. Um, I love cooking when I feel like cooking versus being stressed about cooking. Um, I'm enjoying music and dancing, going to dance class. I enjoy walks. Um, and spending time with my people, spending time with those who I feel a real sense of belonging with, who are my sister friends, and we're doing all of this work individually, personally, and then collectively together, so that, and celebrating one another, so that brings me a lot of joy in this time. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these beautiful offerings. Um, I guess I will just share that one thing that helps me um, create pause are the, the beautiful young ones that I get to be auntie to um, in my life. And I think that, you know, kind of presence that um, young people, you know, invite me into is an, as a reminder of, of that being present and being, you know, with and sharing and holding space with loved ones. Um, and I think what the land teaches me is that, um, you know, we are, we, <laughs> we are small, right? There, there is so much life force beyond humans and, and Western culture and Western knowledges have put humans at the top of this like hierarchy. And I think that there is so much to learn from the more than human beings and the land that um, actually sustains our lives. Well, a question that I just keep trying to ask myself every day is like, how do I love myself today? And each day to be present to what that activity or that moment or something is. Um, and you know, I hope that this um, 
this gathering um, was was part of the the love work um, that we do that connects, you know, learning and liberation um, within and beyond these systems of oppression, um, the connectivity between Lee Patel and Queen Medina and Shiva Sabati um, and myself and each and every one of you that participated. You know, this is um, that collective armor, um, at least that I think can help inspire us as we continue to move forward. I wanna honor everyone's um, time. I know we're at 106, we will close out um, with a little music. And I just wanna also uh, invite everyone to attend uh, Jarvis uh, Givens talk uh, next week. It'll be moderated by Professor Dale Allender. We'll have Dr. Amina Norris and Chris Chapman from Kingmakers of Oakland together discussing fugitive pedagogy. Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching. That was published recently by Harvard University Press. Again, it'll be a lunch and learn. Um, but please, you know, with, with hearts and applause and any noise that we can make um, to just be, you know, forever grateful for the mighty wisdom of Lee Patel, the way that she has shaped our minds and our hearts and our work and our walk in this world. Um, it is absolutely incredible, the power of your pen and the way it reaches into the soul of the story. So thank you for your work. Thank you to your family. Um, and thank you for the teachers that poured into you because you continually to pour um, a path um, and nourish so many of us. Um, so with that, and in the name of, of love and freedom and justice and struggle, uh, may we continue to build. I hope everybody has a blessed day and thank you for uh, being in space with us. Wanted to also thank our ASL translators. Thank you so much, Jill, Jasmine, Jen, I'm sorry, Jen and Jasmine, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Medina, thank you for reminding me to accept things. Yes, I thought I'd look on your face, and I was like, oh, this is, this is hard. I am because you are. I am because you are. Thank you all. I know. There is so much hatred, war and poverty. Teachers, time to teach us.